Good. So um, I have missed you all for the last two weeks. So um, it's been interesting to reflect on the le lecture series and actually change a few things again, as I'm always changing what I'm talking about. But uh, as planned, at least the title stayed the same, World and Sense Making, which is the next part of the series. Um, and World and Sense Making, um, as always, I've got some notes to share with you as we get started. But before we share the notes, I want to make sense of the world that you've created over the last while. So if you remember, we layered our little collaborative story. We started off with some sounds. We then created the landscapes to those sounds. Then we created a mind map of territories and, and questions of the unknown. And then we created little worlds for our little people that we made. And I've just added the thing from last week, uh, from the last time on top. So for those of you that haven't been part of this, I think you've all been part of this journey, right? Anyone here doesn't know what this is? Okay, good. <laughs> so you created some beautiful things last time. They were all standing here, the little figures inside these worlds. And um, I photographed them. As you can see, I incorporated them. And I thought, let's now think of the next set that links to what the, today's talk is about. And that is kind of the idea of creating a collective world, a collective map. A connective journey. So this little Constantina backdrop, this little map in Exquisite Corpse is a way of creating a collective statement. And um, as I said, during the talk, it'll hopefully make, make more sense why we're doing it. So feel free to draw, write, doodle onto the page when you're done, make a mark, pass it to the person that can pass it back to you. So it just becomes something that we make collectively. And at the end, we'll bring them together. Um, so this way of playing and creating mini worlds like you did last time with the little figures and that, that um, that paper. Sorry, I just realized you didn't remind me to record. Sorry. <laughs> so on this journey of um, world and sense making, um, I want to talk about what you did last time with the little figures and those little card creations, these little worlds, and what you're going to be doing now as, a, as an experiment. And that is this, the, the thing that as artists we try to, as I said before, make sense of the unknown, make sense of the world in some way constantly. And the trick to do that for me, and this is a little tool, and I'll take you through some tools and activities that, that help make, uh, do this, is to create mini worlds. This idea of creating something where you have become an avatar towards something else, when you change the perspective, when you use um, world making as a concept in order to tell new stories, in order to understand that which we don't understand, in order to meet new collaborators and to engage with the unfamiliar, and I'll take you through some of those examples. And then to actually create thinking tools. So these little playful things that we do with the little figures or with these pieces of paper that we, that we draw on, etc., are all tools for actually capturing and framing our thoughts, for capturing and framing new ideas, and through looking at the world through new lenses and new perspectives. And so this act of doing that as artists is an extremely valuable tool and is actually something that um, I think a lot of people in society suffer from is the inability to reposition themselves and have empathy for those in other places. And so um, I use a kind of very consciously this world making and sense making relationship as a way to facilitate how to inspire myself to make new work, how to get stuck when you're blocked with something and you're not sure about it. Someone here mentioned to me the other time that there is a moment where they're not sure how to take the next step. For me, to create these mini worlds is a, is a, is a game that helps break away from the big problem or the, the big picture and actually zoom in and play a little bit and in that playing open up new thinking partners and thinking ideas. 
And so these thinking partners are quite important. And I'll show you some examples of uh, collaborations and thinking partners that become really valuable um, as we create these worlds. And usually they come from different disciplines. So while you created these, I want to just make reference to a comparison to a kind of a workshop or a game that I was playing in South Africa. I think these are fantastic. Um, I, I can read so much into what was created in, in these lectures. That at some points I was looking, thinking, is that me on that orange page where it's empty and just me all alone? So I, I'm able to take myself and put myself into your little creations, even though I know this, these were your worlds. But it opens up the possibility to read into it. And so I want to show you an example of a similar kind of activity. Um, these photographs are by a great photographer in, in Johannesburg called Mark Straw, who came to a workshop session and, and joined us with his lens. So he became the witness. But the workshop was really a group of artists and students, uh, or scholars from a school, to say, let's create mini worlds to talk about the problems that we have. I won't go into the content, but what was really interesting, someone actually came with a world. Yeah. He said, here is my world on a stick. And this is actually one of those flower, dried up flower um, arrangement balls you know, for, for some kind of wedding or something. And he says, world making is already there. We have a world. And this idea that there is, we identify with the globe, with something round as the world is a really interesting thing for me. But when you look closely into that world that he presented us, there was this little character that was sitting on the globe. And suddenly his world that he holds up so proudly becomes something very different. You know, it, it's, it becomes scale, it becomes a texture, it becomes something, it becomes a home, it becomes a surface, it becomes something that, that if you change its scale is really interesting. Now this seems very obvious, but when you start playing like that, every little stick, every little piece of grass, every little part of a tree, for example, becomes something that stimulates new ideas. And so I just thought I'd show you um, to complement what you did last time so beautifully in, in, in the space, playing with these little figures, how some other people have interpreted their little figures in another completely different part of the world, uh, sitting in South Africa, in nature, um, in a park, and actually playing with it and creating scenes, scenes that once again witnessed and filmed through a camera, through a lens, because if it's not on a lens, it doesn't exist. So, yeah, this idea of how do we frame, how do we capture, and how do we witness these things. So, the interesting part about all of this is that, at times, the figure itself becomes almost invisible. So, I love this photograph because the little figure that sits underneath this big rock, sitting by the plate, if you don't know straight away that there's someone sitting there, it's almost invisible. All you see is the plate in relation to the object, uh, I mean, in relation to the rock, and it creates a sense of scale. So maybe sometimes we don't need the people to represent that which creates a world in its own right, or something that is a stand-in for a person, which is in this case the plate. And then the obvious is, how do the toys start telling a completely different story? So just by bringing in this vehicle of destruction, or construction, not sure in this case, and destroying the mushroom in, in order to make way for a parking lot. Um, it's a kind of quite nice game to play. And so using toys is a really, really nice way of world making and sense making. Um, so one of the tools that I've got in my re uh, repertoire is toys. So um, I was very fortunate that when I turned 20, my brother turned 10, that's 10 years difference. And he would take me by, by the hand and say, come, big brother, stop flirting with the girls, stop going out to parties, you're going to play Lego with me now. And he would sit down, and I had to play Lego with him for an hour, and that was my duty as a big brother. You know, that's what I have to do. And it became such a nice time for me to, with the age of 20, still be playing. Not by, oh, I'm going to conceptually now make art while I'm studying, and Lego has to be, a, but just to explore what this tool is. And so... Recently, this is still a work in progress. I have no idea where, where this is going to go yet, but I want to show you something. I walked into, uh, I'm in Benin, uh, in West Africa, and I walk into a Chinese shop with all kinds of toys, and I think, I need something to play with. It was so interesting. I need it's a, you know, a piece of plastic. And so I picked up this little tractor because I remembered somehow in the back of my mind probably this image. And... So, so I then, um, coming to stay at the coast in Benin, on, on the coast of, of West Africa, and I noticed that there's a massive construction site. And because a lot of my work has to deal with um, 
migration and politics around migration, I'm fascinated that they want to build a massive museum here for the slave routes that came from West Africa to, to the rest of the world. And, and as that's happening, oh, sorry. Um, as that's happening, I, I find out that this whole construction site is actually funded by China. And that there's not a single Beninese uh, person involved in the making of this construction. And for me, that is very problematic. This is a very complex thing that these companies coming from the outside start to take over the space. And we, I've mentioned this in the talk before, this question of a new colonial power that comes in uh, financially uh, conquering a, a terrain and, and exercising their power through, through, through what they can offer. And so what I, what I did is I realized that in this journey, I should bring in my little, my little um, toy. And so I thought, well, what if this place where I was staying, which was a little house close by, was to be destroyed? Because all of these, this land used to be owned by fishermen. And the fishermen were using this land to go out easily into the coast. And now it was all being turned into this uh, almost wasteland of construction site. And the fishermen were relocated for, without any compensation. And so there's this kind of complexity around this construction site. So I'm waking up in the morning after doing the shadow game on the wall at night. And I'm wondering, what's going to happen? How can I in, in, impose myself into this world making that's happening in there? Someone's creating a new world. And I could not believe it. As I'm sitting there, my little tr red truck comes driving past. My little red truck that I just bought in Chinatown comes driving past. And I thought, wow, yeah, <laughs> this, is, this means something. And so because it, I felt it meant something, I then decided to play. As I said, this is a work in progress. I'm not sure where it's going, but it's just this act of doing and playing became really interesting to me. And so I'm fantasizing and thinking here about how can I kind of make something that talks about the breaking down of the walls, of the destroying of these homes, and you know, this, this piece of China coming to construct a museum that I'm not sure is as valuable as the fishermen villages that were there. And what you're seeing here is me having fun, creating my world, just like you were with your little figures and this piece of paper last week or last time. You know, I'm kind of thinking, well, what if I just allow this tractor to take over this place where I'm staying and, yeah, play. And like every tractor and sand together, it needs to be a sand pit and suddenly the the sand gets moved around, and I'm just going to scrub through this a little bit. Eventually, it becomes a big drawing, and then I feel, ah, oh, now I'm being an artist again, and I'm not just playing. <laughs> and then eventually I decide, well, you know, let me just clean up, because the guy had just beautifully swept the floor before I started to play. And so I have to get rid of the evidence. You know? And so I'm just showing you a kind of very personal journey of, of experimenting and playing with a toy that, that helps us create these worlds. So for me... It was a great reflection and a, a way of trying to make sense of this very complex situation that's happening. And obviously this is informed by a lot of conversations with people that live and work in the area, but at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's me in a strange kind of studio environment that has to experiment and play, play in that way. And that play in this case happened in a public space, but I also collect toys from, for example, my father. And so this film called Occupying, a very short documentary film, is me taking objects from my father's toys when he was a child, which, I, which he kept and gave me, which are these little figures, and placing them into a strange um, home garden space. And then coming with all the junk that I've collected over time from all the projects that I've been doing, and just creating a new landscape, a new kind of junk-filled environment. Again playing and then realizing only after the documentation, I had a filmmaker film me while I was doing this, realizing that my play actually became about making this world that was overrun by this junk. And that this is, for me, a really interesting critical moment around where play and, and world making in the mini sense suddenly becomes a statement that is quite um, powerful. And actually this little experimental performance um, helped me break away from that which yeah, blocked me at the time. And so this, this idea of playing with toys is one tool. 
Another tool that I always like to, and, and the recycling of, of toys, obviously, is, is what I was referring to there. Um, the other thing that I really enjoy is the framing device. How can we, what tools do we have that become framing devices? Now, we all know that this becomes a great framing device. You know, I look through it and you're suddenly inside my lens and I'm framed. And so um, I was fortunate enough, this is another one of these short uh, films, uh, to my father, when he passed away, left me a whole lot of cameras. Because he, as, an, as a photographer, he had all these cameras. I have no idea how to use these cameras, even though he taught, tried to teach me a million times. And so when I unpacked his studio, this is what happened. And so the camera as a framing device is really interesting, not because it creates only a frame when we take a picture, but actually as an object, I think it becomes a really good tool. Again, like the toys, there's no difference for me between the, the, the tractor that you saw and the camera because they both become things to play with. And I'm glad to see one of the two of you are smiling because it's also supposed to evoke some kind of humor that you can have fun with what you are exploring and the framing device is part of it. But then... I, when I moved to Austria from South Africa, the, I only took one thing from my father's with me, and that was a camera, which is the first camera he, he, he got, which was a Hasselblad, beautiful, in a silver case. And I was so excited that I could take this back to Austria, because he never came back to Austria. He, he was born there, but he left for South Africa and never came back. And I came back with his camera that he'd left behind. And I, and I brought this camera back to Vienna, and I put it down on the table, and I thought, what do I do with it? I opened it up, I thought, you know, maybe the Hasselblad camera is worth a lot, I could sell it. <laughs> but I thought, no, this is his lens. And as I opened it up, there were 21 films tucked underneath the, the what do you call the foam that, that you use to protect the camera. 21 undeveloped, no, not unexposed films. So the film that had not yet been processed at all. And so I took those, I thought, wow, that's a nice gift. And then I saw that most of them had expired in 1982, in 1997, and I think the, the oldest film that was there was in the early 80s, and the youngest one was in like 98 or something like that, it expired. And I thought, 1998 expiration date, I don't even know if I can still use these. I don't know if they will develop or not. So I don't know how to use the camera. I don't know how to even insert the spool. I eventually used YouTube to learn it. And, but I have no idea what these films are capable of. So let me let the framing of the lens of my father show me his places in Vienna, that, how he would have seen Vienna through his eyes, with a film that I've got no idea if I can develop and a camera I've got no idea on how to use. And so I'm just showing you a few photographs. I'm still on this journey right now. I've still got about eight spools of the 21 left. So every time I go out for a walk in Vienna by myself and I want to reflect, I take his camera with and I walk around and I, I'm getting a bit better, but I'm intentionally not asking people to teach me how to use this camera. It's about me, the camera, and his perspective. And if there's something that reminds me of my father, I take a picture. And so what you see here are some examples of underexposed, overexposed, blurry, scratchy, and not just because I'm not good, but also because of the film. <laughs> you know, we, I don't know, some films come out completely blank. And so what's, what's really exciting is that there are moments and references that obviously um, uh, one would understand as being part of a, a European city or Vienna maybe even. And then there are others which become completely abstract. Um, and um, as I said, there are many of them. But there's something so magical for me about this creation of an album of photographs after you know, he's passed away through his eyes of what Vienna could have been like in his mind, through his lens, with his exposed, uh, 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 with his bad film. You know, so there's, there's, a, there's a strange searching for something that's happening. And again, for me, this becomes the tool for framing. It becomes a tool for holding on to a moment and creating worlds within that moment. And I don't know where it's going yet. It might become a beautiful exhibition one day. I mean, it's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> Completely gray and underexposed and, and scratched up because the film is scratched. It's, and they become such beautiful objects themselves. And so I'd, I'm not sure yet if this is an exhibition, if this is just a series of pictures, if this is just something for me. But I think that this idea of creating this perspective on a world that I need to get to know through his lens is a really important game.
And so the lens as a framing device, the camera as a tool to play with, becomes something important. But the other tool for me is not just to use them as a form of representation, as I've shown you already, but actually to think about what happens when you actually create something alien and unknown through the lens that you create. So we know that um, the realist painters painted beautiful pictures of things that we could recognize, and then suddenly someone came and splashed paint all over it and went, now it's abstract, and now you have to imagine what it's about. Similarly, we go through these motions as artists. We bounce between being representative and being abstract. So your little figures on the pieces of paper, last time when I was analyzing them, some people wrote notes next to the figures so that I would understand what the relationship is between the figure and the paper, while others tore up the paper and just plonked it on the person and said, well, you interpret it. And there's something so lovely about that. And so I've been fascinated at how can we make sense of the world and create worlds to make sense of them by abstracting that which should be not abstract. I've spoken about it before, but I wanted to show you this particular example because this is one of those that changed my experience completely. So I was invited as an African artist or an artist from the African continent to be part of a fellowship at the Smithsonian Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C. Beautiful big thing. It's a really important moment for me. I'm so excited. I'm going to spend several months in Washington, D.C. in the African Art Department looking at all these artifacts from Africa. And then I realized, why do I have to fly all the way to the USA to see that which should be in my museums? You know, why am I having to relocate? And then I get to the museum and I walk around and I'm fascinated by all of these objects. And I love art history and I love the stories behind these objects, etc. And so I'm, I'm talking to the curators and I'm saying, but where's all the other stuff? You know, where are the real treasures that you have that are not on display? And they take me into the storeroom and then I get really excited. But inside the storerooms... I turn around and I say, well, um, this is very nice, but where, when are we ever going to see these objects? Who's ever going to see them? And I realized these objects were all kind of standing there like lost souls, you know, waiting for something to happen. I felt really sorry for these objects in the museum storerooms. And so I asked the curators and the custodians of the collection to turn off all the lights because there's no better way, as I said before, to play in the dark because then people start to let go. And so... What I then did is, using a torch and camera, documented the shadows that the objects were creating um, and not talking about the objects themselves. So I asked these custodians to turn off the lights and play around with what happens when you just allow the shadows of the objects to, to create a language. And the most amazing thing that came out of that was that they started to look at the shadows like landscapes. They started to talk about the shadows of the objects that to have more value or no, not more value, to have a different value to the objects themselves. The shadows told a story that was abstract. The shadows told a story that you could not identify on the label. And so the fun part, it doesn't matter, you can pass to each other from back to front. <laughs> it's all good. I can give you another one if you want. <laughs> um, so the shadows themselves held information that was... Um, kind of not on the labels that they weren't speaking about. And what they didn't know is that I was actually also recording the audio, which I can't play ever again because they were revealed things that should not be revealed about how these objects got acquisitioned. So, you know, some of these objects that they said, oh, this shouldn't be in our collection, but because we had to buy this, they had to give us this. And it's not a real artifact the way we would like to celebrate. It's actually a souvenir. You know, that's how they were talking about some objects. And I felt sorry for these objects. And in other cases, they said, well, this object is actually was stolen from someone and it should be given back. You know, so there was a very honest moment in the storeroom. But these shadows, these very abstract worlds started to become exactly that, worlds of the unknown, worlds of that which we cannot define by looking at the object. And for me, looking back at this in this sense of constructing the lecture on world making and sense making, it was to say, well, what do you do with this abstract experience in the dark where you're looking at shadows and you feel that there's something in it? And for me, the obvious thing was to project it up large. So this painting is probably the size of this wall. Um, so project it up and then paint the shadows that were captured in the dark. And so by painting these shadows, what starts to happen is they become material. They start becoming other worlds, just like the, the landscapes that you were drawing in the second lecture I gave of the sounds. They become these, these spaces that, that, that are some kind of territory. 
And I realized that as you explore these territories, you just start adding more and more. You start thinking about, well, what if I go into this landscape? What if I add another layer? So then you add another layer. What if I add another layer? So you add another layer. And eventually it becomes completely abstract. And the, and the thing which was so defined becomes abstracted. And for me, there's something so nice because that means that I'm now sucked into a complete landscape, which is actually a series of shadows of objects that have nothing to do with landscape, but they embody some kind of meaning. So as an artist, that I think is my task in creating unknown worlds and spaces like that. Um, and then in the classic sense of the word, you have to exhibit these things, otherwise they make no sense, apparently. So then you exhibit to them and then you realize that they lose their worldliness. This now just becomes an exhibition of paintings. It's lost that quality of being stuck in the museum. Even when you make a little installation at the back, so this little installation was with flashing lights and created shadows, it becomes a, 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 a what do you call it, like a, a mini version, like the mini worlds, or a mock-up of that which you should be experiencing. So it's, it's frustrating for me as an artist because I want to invite everyone into that storeroom in the dark to explore the collection because that's really the experience of breathing the object smells of exploring with the torch and exploring Africa in a foreign museum is kind of an exciting idea. And then when, once you put it into an exhibition format, you lose all of that and it becomes about showing something. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that tension, but I don't always like it. So showing the world making is not always the solution. I'm quite self-critical of this installation because I don't think, I think it becomes like a, a designed version of the, op of the experience. So how does one play between having the actual experience and, de and designing it? And so I, I thought a lot about what, 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 what that meant in terms of not showing the real object, but just the shadow, having the experience. And so when I, when I was working in Amsterdam on the Schipfahrt Museum, which is the, the National Maritime Museum, they've got a crazy collection. And some of the objects are a bit dubious as well in terms of their heritage and background. But what I did is instead of sh taking the object, I took cutouts. So literal just kind of wooden cutouts of the objects and created a set so that the audience can see the objects not being the real objects, but just mimics of the objects. And having searchlights, they would then create shadows that move across the building in order to reveal what's inside the building on the facade. So as you went past with a the boat, these, uh, these shadows dance across as the searchlights move across these objects. So replacing that, which is the authentic, the real, the object in the museum, with something two-dimensional to create a world. A little bit like props on a stage, when you create little kind of shablons in order to puppets or something in order to replace something that's there. And so this idea of creating worlds through replacements, through fakes, through things that no longer exist is also quite interesting. Here the, the painting becomes a replacement for objects that were lost in Syria during the war there and the, all the buildings that were completely destroyed and the artifacts and the souvenirs that were brought, no, the souvenirs that were brought back from Syria um, be, started to replace the artifacts. So it's no longer the original, is no longer part of it. So now we're creating world of fakes because the original had been destroyed. So the souvenir suddenly becomes valuable. So now you put a souvenir in the museum and you say, this is a replacement for the original. Or you put a painting up to say, this was once an object that is no longer there, but is just a destroyed painting. So this question for me of um, what creates a world, is it always in the imaginary or can it be a fake item to create that world is, is fascinating. And Egypt in that sense is a really interesting space to look at. So for example, um, Queen Nefertiti is this bust um, that sits in the Berlin Museum. So in Berlin, in the museum, there's a bust in a big room. You can go there and you can look at it and you can marvel at this beautiful sculpture that's standing there. And this Neue Museum gets thousands, millions of visitors to come and see this object. And they have it, standing in Berlin. You go to Cairo, and there's markets full of objects, all carved, selling you the souvenir, which is not even in Cairo. You go to Berlin, to the Neue Museum gift shop, and there is a 3D printed version of a scan, 3D scan of the original that you can buy. This is the one from the gift shop in Berlin, this is the one from Cairo Market. Which one is more authentic? 
the one that's 3D scanned and then 3D printed in Berlin, or the one that's carved by an Egyptian man on the side of the road in Cairo and sold to me as a tourist. They're both replacements for the original because the original is, you're not even allowed to photograph. When you come with your camera like this and you walk past like I did, the security goes, all right, kind of photos. And I'm like, okay, fine. You know, it doesn't even belong to you, but you don't let me take a picture. So it makes me angry. Anyway, so, so, my, so what's been created are worlds within worlds. So the replacement world is a, such an interesting thing. What, what's the, the original gets replaced. It creates an environment, creates a context. I just thought I'd share with you also, because I've got the video here. This is John Romer. John Romer made a series of, of documentaries about the, what, what, what he, I'm going to explain it to you, uh, the, the, the rape of Egypt, the fact that all these objects have, were taken away, the plundering and the, and the extraction of all these objects and where they sit and very critical um, uh, um, stance, an incredible Egyptologist that, that was very much frowned upon by the museums because of his strong stand against this this pillaging of Egypt, and then the counterpoint is, well, if they didn't pillage and the objects weren't sitting in some European museum, then maybe nothing would be left. And so, so there's this debate, but what I've, why I'm showing you this is um, I became fascinated by these numbers that are written, handwritten on all of the objects in the Cairo Museum in Egypt. It's obviously the Egyptologists um, and the archaeologists writing codes onto the objects, so they've got some kind of Western numeral, almost like a tattoo or a stamp or a prison stamp, and these objects stand in the museum with their prison stamp telling people what the number they are. And so when you go into a museum like that, you start realizing that that is, again, is not even a world that's created by those that made these sculptures for a reason, but it's created by the museum to tell you about how great they are that they collected these objects. And for me, that is such an interesting twist. You know, we're creating worlds to show off how good we are at collecting other people's things. And I find that this, this, this game is one that, that, that we do as artists anyway, but sometimes it's nice for the audience to do it too. So sticking with the, with the Egyptian theme, in the Roma and Palazzaus Museum in Hildesheim in Germany, I took a group of um, visitors, participants, students, and artists, and it was a whole group of people, and we walked through the museum and we filmed the collection. So we had the museum turn off the light and we filmed the exhibits. So not the storerooms, but the exhibit playing with light and creating shadows. And then we projected that onto the outside of the building. And the film that we projected was actually quite a, became quite a poetic journey um, through, through the exhibition, where the shadows completely transformed the building once it was projected. Unfortunately, I don't have a film of the projection on the building, which is really stupid, but um, this was the film that was then projected on the outside. Very subtle, soft shadows kind of moving around, um, some, some playful moments. The sound piece we then also made in a workshop together. And what was really beautiful for me, it became a replacement. So, so if the museum disappeared tomorrow, because all the objects had to be given back to where they came from, maybe the shadow landscape that we've created could be a nice replacement. So you could just have an empty museum with a projection on the outside of the objects that were once in the museum. I love that idea. You know, create a world where the object becomes completely invisible. It disappears. It's no longer important. All that's important is the abstraction of the shadows that are created and the stories that, that were told. And there are moments in this where you can actually recognize what it is. There are moments where it just looks like pure landscape, like this. And then there are moments where you might be able to recognize an object or so. Um, yeah, like yeah, this, this video, is, the project is not very good here, but um, let's see if I can find some. There, some of these objects one might recognize if one knows what they are. There's something that looks like a, a dog figure or a cat figure. Um, and so... There, those are definitely Egyptian figures, <laughs> some sort. Yeah. And so, so you start making uh, mental connections to some of these objects that could have been in the museum um, and in my mind might, ne might not be there forever. Um, obviously, sound is a very strong component to this, but we're not going to worry about that now. But it was about collectively also figuring out what sound these objects would make. And we, we, we went online and we did a, 
interesting mix of sound collections to see what would happen, uh, what this landscape could be like. And then there's some interesting cross-references. So for example, that bull and this bull from the Syrian artifacts that have that been destroyed in, in, in the war started to are quite interesting connections. So that you start realizing that sometimes these worlds have formal languages in their shadows that that um, remind one of the other. And so you start connecting worlds. But um, Trying to make sense of one's own world is even more complex. So um, I'm, born, uh, I'm born to Austrian parents living in South Africa, born in South Africa and, and growing, up, growing up there. Um, I have a relationship to place, to context, but I'm migrant just like everyone else on that land. I'm, I'm brought in somehow, a considerate home, but my connection to artifacts from the continent are very complex because obviously there's a colonial history, there's an identity history, there's a question of positioning oneself in relation to these objects. And so I often contemplate and question what is the story that is not being told? What is the story or the world that I do not understand? And what is the one that I want to create? I've shown you by the shadows the worlds that I could create, the worlds that I like to play with around the unknown. But what becomes really interesting when you start asking people who you think should understand that world, to think about it. So I invited three poets, uh, Lebuchang Mashile, Prophet JD, um, and Mantala Nkwatse, to come and examine these objects in the, in the museum in Johannesburg, in the Witwatersrand Museum. Um, and this, contemporary art, uh, this collection of art in this art museum um, is in storage, and for this exhibition, we had brought out objects of divination, and these objects were presented to the poets, and I filmed them talking about these objects and then created an installation with them, with, um, you know, projected on top of the objects, their, sh their shadows of talk talking about it, so that it becomes this layering, again, creating another world. But what was really interesting for me is, as you walk through the installation, you've got these sound showers where the poets are responding with voice voices. And so what I've done here is I've compiled the voices and layered them as you would hear it in the installation. I'll just play you a small clip of this. Each one of them had a dialogue with the objects, trying to understand what they are. And I realized my assumption, just because there is some kind of um, a cultural relationship between where the objects come from, the ancestors of this tribe of people, and the people that, 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 that were holding the object, it didn't mean that they could necessarily understand what it was about either. And I loved that idea that in that translation, and my assumption, came a complete chaos of what you're hearing, just this layering of voices that actually make you realize that they too have to create worlds to make sense of that which is supposedly significant culturally to them. It's probably the same as if you come across a, a, an object from your grandfather's generation and say, well now, do I really understand it if I hadn't been told by my grandfather about this thing? Or you know, what is, what is the symbolic relationship? How deep does the the oral history go, is it documented, have I read up on it? And so these, these opportunities for creating this, 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 I guess, lost in translation moment where you try to explain something, but you cannot because it's been, that meaning has been lost to you is quite nice. And this search for that which one doesn't know is inside becomes really important. And as you know from the other lectures, my passion of drawing is really part of that. And so often 
like this is in a uh, in the museum storerooms i go and i imagine what could be inside this these boxes because we always see boxes standing around in museum draw storerooms but we don't know what's inside so i imagine the shadows from the artifacts and the objects and so in some poor museum storeroom the <laughs> there are there are a whole range of containers that i've just guerrilla action painted what could be inside them creating the imaginary of what we cannot see but what is inside and i think that which we cannot see but what is inside becomes an important thing to think about when you trying to tell the untold stories when you're trying to document and play with capturing what happens every day um we we write we draw we sketch I mean, you're all sketching at the moment on some piece of paper with little notes. Um, and I feel it's really important that one doesn't necessarily interpret those drawings always, but it allows them to be what they are. So this journal of mine of a month-long journey in West Africa is something that only I and maybe one or two people that were with me would be able to interpret and understand. That's the red tractor, by the way. Interesting. I could now, now you see, now we made a link. There's the red tractor in the landscape, destroying the landscape. Um, which was a sketch that I made while I was thinking about the space. And so thinking and drawing, creating worlds in, by, by creating a narrative for yourself becomes a really interesting tool to come back to. And I can see so many little worlds and installations I want to make from this. I want to recreate this scene one day in, in, a, in a work. I want to play with some of the sketches that I made to make them into big paintings or into drawings or installations. And it's that act of of capturing that's really important. And so one collects and collects books. Um, these are some of the journals. That's why, again, this is such an important format for me because they usually become Constantina journals that, that capture something that, that are about finding the earth, finding the land, drawing with the land, capturing it and, and tearing the paper, building with it. Um, tricks that we all play with. I think we, we all had the opportunity at some point or another to, to take a piece of ground and just rub it into the piece of paper and see what happens. But by doing that, that piece of paper has become the set for something else. And for me, it's so interesting because we put ourselves into that every time we look at it. So it's no different from creating, the, the creating of a set in this case is no different from actually building a set. So for example, when, I'm, uh, when I was inspired in a, in a, in a part of Ireland with, with a collaborator of mine and now we were talking about the land, etc., and you start yeah, just quickly opening a book and start drawing and creating something and then seeing what happens when you place it into that landscape and how it captures an emotion, a feeling, um, a reference for you. You know, these, these, these sketchbooks are sketchbooks. They're ideas, they're gestures. By no means are they final artworks or anything like that, but they are little worlds that are created that are representations for the big world. So they become like windows Every time I open that book, it's stepping into that landscape, even though the landscape can never be there, or I can't be, be there. And I think that's a really important thing. It's also about, <laughs> this is the same book, just on the other side, I found this pile of, of uh, there we go. Um, I found this pile of uh, tires, and I realized that um, the same landscape, which is so beautiful and green at the same time, is suffering from something else. And, um, and so I turned the book around and started to draw on it. But that relationship, again, with the object as a representation of that which one feels um, is something that helps me emotionally connect back to my work. So going back into the studio, opening this book, I don't have to look at the photographs. I don't have to go back in, on my phone going, when was that? When was that? When was that? I want to see that photo. I want to see the video. But actually, because I got my hands dirty, because my, my, when I finished with this particular drawing, my hands were full of ash and, and black things, and I, and I you know, did that, and obviously then my jeans were full, and it, was, and it smelled funny, and it was just the way it was. And that I'll never forget. And that helps me connect emotionally to my own work again. So it's that recreating the little world through the senses by actually making things physically in a space. And so bringing it closer to here, I just wanted to share with you um, when I went to this wonderful mine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was a moment where I thought, let me draw into a book and see what happens. Let me collect some objects and place them onto that book. Let me see what happens with, with the coal. I have no idea what's going to happen to the book. I've got no idea what's going to happen next in terms of the thinking around this. But it was me trying to connect with a place and while I have billion photographs of this, it's so nice to have a, a, an image and an evidence of, 
of the actual act of making. Because sometimes it's nice to know that you were there, so you can say, look, I was there and I made a drawing. But I, I get nothing from this photograph. I get everything. And I forgot the book at home. I wanted to bring it. I'm sorry. I get everything from that book that I made. You know? um, and so I think it's, it's these, these, these worlds we create within the covers of our sketchbooks or within the, we don't all sketch. I mean, it could be in the cover of your laptop when you, if you're typing stories. It's, it's inside the box, there are worlds. Inside the cover, there are worlds. Inside the folds, inside the creases, inside these, these elements, there are landscapes. And so there's something really valuable about, again, the scale of the relationship of us as artists being able to scale it down so that it's only this big and if I can put it in my pocket and it's a world in my pocket and I'm going to hold on to it. There's another side to it though, and that's because um, sometimes you can't hold on to it and opportunities arise. <laughs> so while I'm drawing, um, I also, as you can see, it's a very landscape orientated work. A lot of my work is very much about landscape and context. And um, I would get fascinated when you look in Google, as, as you know from previous work, from above the drawings in the landscape that exist. So this, for example, is in the north of of South Africa in Limpopo on the border to Botswana and this beautiful large natural territory. You've got these drawings of landscapes, of spaces of occupation, of lines that define spaces and territories because farmers put up their farms. And so you can see as we're zooming in, um, you know, these, these lines might move from straight lines to more squiggly lines, but they're still like drawings that, that someone made at some point consciously or unconsciously, but someone actually created these farmlands and put fences around them. And I was very fortunate because um, a, uh, a friend of mine bought a whole lot of those farms, which is so nice, and turned it into an e is turning it into an eco-farm, so into a kind of biologically kind of supportive farm with all the um, wild animals that, that should roam the land. And um, what's so fascinating, what they do when they... Um, when, when they take the fences down, when they buy the farms that are next to each other, which were used for cattle and things like that, and they want to turn it into a uh, space for wildlife. So here you see how the territory is divided by these fences and these roads on either side and these pieces of metal that are put against the fence to, to scare the big animals away so they don't destroy the fence. And then electric fencing there to also get the animals that want to knock over the fence to stay away. So it's a very kind of hardcore division of space and ownership and what's happening is as they're buying these farms they are getting rid of these fences so you can start seeing there's these leftover poles standing around in the landscape and for me that was so amazing he was actually world making this eco farm um, and 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 playing with redesigning in order to try and rehabilitate the land so from a big scale zooming out he was kind of doing what I was doing in my little book he was taking the pages and he was flattening it out and trying to rub out the lines. You can't rub those lines out, they're forever there. But what is really important and really interesting for me is, the, like when you rub something out with the eraser, you always get the little pieces that are left on your paper. I have kind of felt he was rubbing out the fences, but what was left was the fence itself. So the fence itself on the landscape became like this little flex, if you were to zoom out. And what that is, it's these big round balls of fence. So what they do is they go with them with a big truck and they roll the fences up and then they're left with these big things of wire. And they, they're not valuable enough to sell, but they are um, they, 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 they're a problem, bless you. They're a problem in the landscape. You know? And so we carved out a piece of land and, and a drawing in the landscape and there you see me doing a study and being very important about making art in the landscape. This is all work in progress. Um, but what it is, is it's, it's a very large area, which has now got, there it is, oh, there's a, there it is again. So it's, we, we drew this, we, 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 we made an extra drawing in the landscape, and all along in this, in this area, we've placed these balls of wire. This was about six years ago. Yeah, even longer. And so, so laying all around here are these balls of wire, and every year I go back, and I watch what's happening to these balls of wire. And it's amazing how their little worlds are happening inside these balls of wire. This, it's, it's starting to get occupied. It's starting to become a home for little creatures. It's starting to become overgrown by plants. 
It's become this incredible place where you think it's a junkyard. It's actually become an incredible place of, of material life of some sort. And nature doesn't give a shit. Nature just carries on and is deconstructing all of this metal in its own way and taking ownership of it. And the best part of that journey is that these pieces of metal I showed you earlier that are hanging on the fence, they're different shapes. Um, only um, uh, end of last year when I was back there, I collected these pieces of metal and I laid them together on the floor and I realized there's this beautiful map and this beautiful drawing that nature is making for me. So these are just the textures and the, and the, and the weathering of, this, of these metal sheets that have now been lying there for seven years or something like that in that, in that, in that landscape that, um, that are now becoming little canvases in themselves and are becoming these drawings, are becoming these memories. So the only thing I've taken from this whole project, which exists in somewhere in a tiny little place in Limpopo, hidden away in the bush in, in South Africa, are these um, nine pieces of metal that sit in my studio in Vienna. And I just don't know what to do with them. But they hold for me that whole world of these weird things and these, and these, and these separation landscapes and this changing of the land and everything. And it holds all of that experience just in some rusty piece of metal. And I think that's so valuable to understand what that does as it opens up one's inspiration. So if I feel like I need to do something, I'm just going to run my hand over that and I can feel it. And I, and I, I just kind of imbibe the relationship with, 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 the, with, the, with that space. And I think that's how we transport ourselves creatively in the studio into another place, by having these things around us. I mean, what is interesting is that that same site... We are also where you saw me walking around doing some funny drawings is also one of the favorite places for the lions to hang out in the farm. Now that it's all open, they've brought in lions and there's elephants. There's a beautiful farm now. It's a com complete eco-balanced system. Uh, but this, for whatever reason, is a place that's popular for lions. So when I was there last year, I kind of forgot about that. And I was busy doing this thing and the guy that was holding the camera kept on... like. <laughs> moving away and I said come come we're going further and he said no but there are lions here and there's something so interesting about knowing that the that that you're in a kind of complete foreign environment and 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 worried about it but the other thing that you meet along the way and I don't know why that slide is not here because I think it's more important than what I'm showing you right now I'm just going to jump to this slide um what you meet right now um while you're doing that and this comes from the same place is the the unfamiliar collaborator, the collaborator you don't expect. And that's where it gets magical. You realize there's some creature making a world. It doesn't get more literal than that. It comes back to the round globe. You know, this dung beetle finds dung, lays its, rolls it, lays its eggs in the dung and rolls them until it becomes this cocoon and then rolls it through the mud till it gets another layer and creates this beautiful ball that then holds life and becomes a whole nother ecosystem of, of life. And the dung feeds the little, uh, the, the little creatures that grow inside and then they break out and then it just becomes a cycle of life in this beautiful metaphor. And so while this creature is making this beautiful dung ball, I'm fortunate enough to find one. So this is, it's quite big and it's heavy. So again, an artifact I had to take with me. You know, I smuggled it into Austria. No one lets you take that shit with you. Anyway, so, so it's literally a shit. That's why I can say that. Um, so so um, finding this thing and, and just smelling it and being inside it and kind of just putting my nose into it like this and just smelling what, what the, the, the place smells like, what it feels like. It's an incredible nostalgia to something that we, that we want. It's a thing that teleports us into that space. It's like eating that food that someone made when you were somewhere and then... Suddenly, you, like your, all your senses go crazy and you go, oh, you know, I could be there, wherever it was. And it's that magic that I think kind of this world-making concept really holds for me. It's, it's creating conditions that reposition you and, and immerse you into another place. And for me, the collaborator that helped me do that is this little dung beetle. And I think that's interesting because these are unfamiliar collaborators we don't expect. These are encounters that we, that we think you know, could, never, could never really be part of our... Of our, of, of our journey because there are other moments where it's forced and it's not bad forced but it's forced where you're finding the unknown collaborators and that comes now to the multidisciplinary part in setting up moments where you are actually intentionally clashing 
disciplines where you're intentionally clashing um, approaches. So Art Meets Science Meets Place is a project I started in, in Port Elizabeth in South Africa where art uh, masters and PhD students and, and uh, science masters and PhD students went together into uh, the natural environment and started to map it according to their knowledge system, into their way of understanding the world. This is nothing new. We've all done this with other scientists and artists. But what's really exciting is when you start walking through a natural habitats and you start having conversations about um, what it means to see the world from these different ways. And then what comes out of it are design languages through conversations between artists and scientists and engineers um, to start designing bridges based on the leaf that you find. You know, it's little things like that that start showing you that actually this, the, the, the encounter of different disciplines makes it so much richer. And... This, this encountering between art and science is, as I said, something that's very common. But what, what I, I feel um, as an artist makes me really excited by this um, approach is gaining a kind of different perspective on that which I would assume to be normal. So my little sketchbook is my sketchbook, it's my perspective. Give it to a scientist and allow them to interpret it as something completely different. And so born out of that world making of the art and science becomes what happens when you then take that dung ball, for example, and you project it onto a planetarium where the scientists are talking about space. You know, and you start saying, well, that dung ball represents Earth. It represents everything that's wrong with Earth. It becomes the Earth that is destroyed. It becomes the Earth that is broken. You know, the dung ball is actually that which we should be nurturing because it should be holding our kids. But actually what we're doing is we're leaving it exposed as this piece of um, something that, that, that needs to be dealt with. And then how do scientists respond to that provocation? What do they say when you start representing um, Earth in that way? And that's where it starts gets really exciting. And so in that, I'm going to skip this video. In that, I want to introduce you to a kind of approach that, that's, that's part of the world making. And that's saying, finding the worlds outside of the discipline of art. In this case, we created something called the zone which is this collaboration between these four people, which is a scientist or biologist, an evolutionary biologist, and a philosopher, a curator, and two artists, coming together and saying, how can we use cross-disciplinary collaboration to define the third space? So if there was a space of science and a space of art, what happens if there was a third discipline, a space that exists between the two? How would we define it? Can you define it? How does it go beyond the art and science collaboration into something which is about the lived experience, about creating new knowledge systems that have to do with the engagement of both disciplines and learning from both, but not replacing either or? So what if when they were sitting designing the silos, saying, oh, we're going to have science, we're going to have art, they actually designed a third one, the space in between. And that space in between is not just about you can see there are lots of examples. I just threw up some, some images to show the kind of the, the cross-section of things. It's not just about making and playing in, 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 in spaces between artists and scientists and exploring. Um, and that's what really a large part of it is about. You know, um, uh, philosophers contemplating uh, quick, uh, kind of fundamental questions, scientists exploring uh, how the scientific pursuit and the artistic pursuit are at, at uh, kind of contrast to each other. And this is a whole lecture in itself. But what's important for me here in terms of the summary is that it's about what happens in my mind when I've got philosophers and scientists sitting in my studio. When in my studio, suddenly there's a discussion about worldly things that I have got no clue about, and they create a bubble in my studio that I can go back into. They create a philosophical approach to my practice that I would never be able to do. And we were very fortunate that Johannes Jäger, who's, a, who's an evolutionary biologist and philosopher, has invited us to be part of this, this research project called Pushing the Boundaries, Agency, Evolution, and the Dynamic Emergence of Expanding Possibilities. It's basically, in a summary, it looks specifically at what I'm talking about here, the theater of, or the question of the theater and the world making of, how do we engage with the world? Is the world a machine or an organism? Up until now, the world has been treated like that, as if it's machine on the inside. We're trying to solve our problems by finding the next piece of tech, the next AI, the next piece of algorithm, the next piece of object, the next cog, you know, the next tool to fix it. 
but actually the biologists, the evolutionary biologists specifically are saying, actually there's an evolution that's happened to create the world. Why do we think we can replace evolution with tech? And what does it mean that we treat our world as a machine instead of as an organism? And so this research is philosophically really fascinating because it pulls into question all of these things that we've assumed until now in how we solve our problems, how we refer to ourselves, how we fix our bodies. We treat ourselves and our world in the form of machine. But what if we actually reconsidered that and what if we contemplated that the organic nature of who we are as humans, who our world is, um, can be treated differently and, and, adju and adjusted? And I find that a really interesting provocation because it basically means we go back to that dung ball. We go back to the thing that, that, that nature has shown us works in a certain way and has a certain rhythm. And while we're in the midst of this research, the philosophers are really contemplating and, 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 and playing with the, the fact that the sciences has to protect itself. The sciences can no longer make worlds that are fascinating and unknown. They have to use the language that exists in order to defend their position because they have the power. The art world is doing exactly the same thing. It has to defend its position in order to maintain its power. But when we start talking about disrupting that power by looking at alternative possibilities and alternative systems for dealing with world making, sense making, um, you need to break down those silos and you actually have to question the establishment and how the establishment works. And this is where philosophically it's really exciting. So it's not to say that everything that exists is bad, but it's to say what happens if you break that mold a little bit and create mini worlds that show the abstract, the unknown. And so that new perspective has only come through the dialogue with philosophers and scientists because if I was stuck in my studio by myself, I would just be making art and drawing more pictures and making more books and everyone would say, those are nice books, they smell funny because they're made of some poor animal's um, dung, but you know, um, that's great. But now suddenly a philosopher is saying, but wait a minute, the fact that you painted in an animal's dung and made this book while you were in the midst of this weird territory, does that not evoke a different way of sense making about the world that you live in? And now the philosopher is reflecting on that and thinking about it within the context of the research. I obviously didn't paint with dung, it was just a reference, but you know what I mean. Um, so what I thought to, to end off the session, I'm gonna show you one film. It's not very long, I've cut it up into segments. But why I want to show it to you is it was, just, uh, it was a theater piece that was performed a month ago in Johannesburg. Um, it's a collaboration between um, a whole uh, group of people, Mark Fleischmann uh, and, and Naoma Yangi and um, Jenny, who you see in the middle there, Resnick. And um, it was, uh, it's, the piece is called This Death Here. And it holds... Um, this question of Daedalus, the father of Icarus, who becomes the inventor, the genius, that uses the mechanical tools that he has to his disposal to make the wings to, for Icarus to be able to fly into the sun or towards the sun. So he's the one that believes he's got the solution for the world. And it's a little bit of a play on where we are in today's time, this idea that we create worlds using machine, we create worlds using using technology and we think that that's the solution. What's so beautiful about this piece in today's um, presentation for me is that it's, it's one way of um, reinterpreting the machine and what happens. So just so you understand that what the film is, it's, it's a few minutes long, but it's uh, snippets from the performance uh, overlaid with the drawings that I did live projected behind the performance. So, so this is a live drawing tool where I'm actually drawing in response to the space. Some of it is pre-programmed, but most of it is live. And then the performers perform. Well, obviously I wasn't, unfortunately I wasn't there for the performance, so that live drawing was replaced with a recording, but it was done in context of the rehearsals um, and the making. And so what I want to urge now while you are the beginning, you can watch and then the sound will take over. I would like for you, now that you've made little landscapes, you're gonna take one of these little uh, cards and make a little flag for yourself <laughs> that we're going to put in front of your exquisite corpse landscape. Um, uh, just, I don't know why, I just think it'd be nice. And on that flag, I want you to express something about world making. It's a flag that represents your world or the world that you want to make um, as a little game. So, um, there are, are sticks as well, but you can put them in afterwards. But, uh, 
yeah, just take one and pass on. If you want to do them. Every person, everyone take one and, and pass on. Here, uh, yeah. I'll just give you the packet. Okay, so behind you, they need. So, so the idea is just for now, just draw onto, just draw onto the flag your, your world concept, your world making, your storytelling, anything you want in relation maybe to what you've drawn on the paper, I don't know. And then we'll make little flags of it. But do watch a little bit this video, but I want you to be inspired also by the sounds and the rhythms because the sounds and the rhythms were specifically composed by Neo into this incredible space um, that talks about this very complexity that we exist in, the space between the two. So here is this death here. Two. 
So the um, the journey of this last world that you saw right at the end was uh, this idea that once we come to a point in our world where we realize that even Icarus flying too close to the sun, falling down and dying is not necessarily going to heal that which we have created given the condition that we leave our world in if we carry on treating it this way. It was more about what is the imaginary world that we create from that. And so once it all fuses together, and you see the table with where Icarus had fallen and the, the gods come and lament and sit around, stand around the table and kind of contemplate what happens next, you know, a world creates itself. And I think in terms of future visions, that is really where we are the strongest. Creatively, we are the visioneers of the new world. And I don't think we should be naive enough to think we could do that alone. And so I think that dialogue with those that are thinking in that way, that are researching in that way, that are making in that way, like the biologists, the philosophers, um, the parents, I guess, even, you know, whoever is in that space of trying to think about your future and about uh, the, the way it could go forward is your collaborator in that sense. And so whether it's a dung beetle or um, the philosopher in your studio, I think it just becomes an interesting space to be in this world, uh, this world making. And obviously, the other really important person in world making is the person sitting next to you because we just made worlds. So let's bring the things that you've made forward and let's put them together on the table here like we always do. And I've made little, I've brought little stands for our flags. So let's bring them here and let's set up, you can stick your flag into these bases and set up your world behind it like a backdrop to your flags. So, oh wow, look at that. So let's stand them like this and then we pop the little flags in front. So while we're doing that, are there any questions? Well, are there any comments? Are there any observations? Any concerns? Any? Wow, that's bright. Did that all make sense? So for it, use power, use force. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's add the, let's, let's kind of create an a continuous one. Let's see what happens. Fantastic. I don't know if they all stand. Great. Lovely. Yeah, let's move it over a bit. Yeah. You want to add yours here? <laughs> yes, that's the best part, is if you can laugh about it afterwards. I mean, there we go. Let's. So what's, what starts to get really nice, I'm going to glue these together so that we've got a kind of an ongoing book at the end of your journey. <laughs> so... So I know this was a little bit of a kind of weird thing to be doing while I'm talking and you're listening and you're playing and whatever. But, but it's this automatic drawing. It's this uncertainty about why. Why am I doing this? What am I doing around world making? What, what is this about? That hopefully gives you insight into, into your own thing. I think this is fantastic. It's like a, so what we should do now is we should cut them up and then jumble them up and put them back together. <laughs> um, These are great. Yeah. I mean, how many of you are world makers, do you think? Show of hands, in your studios. Yeah, I think so, thank you. I wanted that answer, I wanted everyone to say, me, <laughs> obviously. I mean, it's, it's so interesting because when I have this conversation with curators, so we had a, a workshop with curators in in Paris now, in, in, a, in a museum, where we spoke about world making in the display um, of the collection. You know, what, what does it mean? And um, that's why I was changing a few things when, when, when after that, after that uh, meeting last week. And it was just about how 
we think it's always someone else's job to create our worlds for us. And it's so interesting, even the curator said, yes, well, you know, we do it for the audience. You know, in this case, it's a very classical museum. You know, we do it for the audience from small to old. And so they are the ones that give us the perspective on the world that we create for them, as opposed to, well, let's go completely crazy and then let's pull them in in certain ways. You know, it was an interesting debate. And so it's not always about just uh, you have to um, assume that someone else makes it for you, but you have to be making it yourself. Uh, that I think in this world, we need to travel to another world. Exactly. That's a nice way of putting it. Yes. Yeah. You actually have to take that step into the other world. Yeah. 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 Just your oh, it looks so fantastic. Have you got a picture of everyone just standing here? Like this looking. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. <laughs> Judging the worlds. Exactly. It's like, hmm, this one is good. This one's all right. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it becomes really exciting when you, like this last piece I showed, when you're on the stage with Actors. I mean, it was all a piece that was developed together. The, the vocalists, the composer playing live with his electronic things and his piano and the drawing, it all happened in this kind of strange stepping into each other's worlds and then something coming out of it. The fact that I don't understand the language, you didn't understand the language, and yet it's inspiring to be working because you understand the essence of what it's about. These are all, all really nice things. Discovering. Yeah. Good. Are you all happy? Are you all feeling fine? Are you ready to go home <laughs> into the cold? <laughs> I hope, the, I hope this, this gave you something. I hope you felt uh, it was worth the time that you spent. So thank you. And um, looking forward to next week's session. And I've just got to think about what I'm going to do with this now. <laughs> this is my homework. <laughs> I don't think I can add anything more to that video. It's full. <laughs> I think so. I might just add something afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then in the last session, I've kept everything we've made in the other session. So in the last session, we'll put everything on the table together. <laughs> so. It'll be like an exhibition. Exactly. It'll be another world. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So if there's any other, no other questions, are you okay if I keep this and I scan them in? Anyone want to keep their, their little things? I mean, do you, does anyone want to say anything about their flags or about their things? I think they're so nice. I mean, some of them wrote, so I was just, uh, I love this. <laughs> Brilliant. Whoever wrote this is great. Thank you. <laughs> I was watching the video you played and forgot.